Welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're here in sunny Florida at the NASA Kennedy Space Center. And joining us now is Mike Tonelli, who is the program manager for the Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned Program. Thanks for being on the show, Mike. Thank you for the invitation. Now, this program is near and dear to your heart. Can you tell us a little bit about that Lessons Learned program? Certainly. The Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned program is a brand new innovative effort uh, agency-wide to take the lessons of the past and showcase them towards a future perspective. And so we're looking at a very exciting future for NASA. We've got exciting programs such as SLS going back to the moon by 2024 and a host of other programs and missions that the agency is having. With those new programs and missions also come a brand new workforce, thousands of new people. And a lot of those folks haven't had the time yet to bridge the lessons of the past to the future. And that's our responsibility. So we're taking a look at the past, both the things we did right and the things we could have done better, putting through that lens, focusing on the future, so therefore they can take the lessons of the past, look at the future, and apply those to increase their mission success going forward. So with Apollo, Challenger, and Columbia, and we're looking at the tragedies that were involved with, with those three. We primarily focus on Apollo 1, Apollo 13, Challenger, and Columbia. We teach the lessons of how things could have gone better. However, we also do take time to look at the good things because in through 60 years of plus of NASA history, there's a lot of great lessons of NASA's done things really, really well. For example, STS-1, the first launch of Space Shuttle Columbia in 1981, was a stunning success. The first reusable spacecraft in the world. So we want to take examples like that and showcase them because all the new vehicles coming online, both commercial and NASA, will have the first processing flows and their first launches. So we can gleam a lot of great expertise and knowledge from those times as well. So it's a mix both of things we could have done better, plus times we got it spot on right. Now, a part of that program is the Columbia Room, where you have artifacts from the tragedy of Columbia Space Shuttle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Certainly. Uh, when we lost Columbia on February 1st, 2003, we had an effort, the largest ground search in American history, to bring Columbia home. Uh, once that was completed, the decision by our leadership at the time was to make Columbia accessible to the workforce and is accessible for the purpose of teaching. So Columbia now still has a mission to perform. The crew still has a job to do, and that job is to teach and inspire the next generation. So folks that come into the Columbia Preservation Room will see artifacts of Columbia. As they walk through those, it's a storytelling journey explaining what happened, but also the lessons that came out of every single phase of the flight of how decisions were made and how perhaps in some ways we could have made better decisions. So they can then take those examples, take them back into the workplace, and as they're working on their programs and, and missions, they can reflect back and hopefully serve as an instrument of guide to them going forward. If they reach those decision points, they can use it as a tool making the right decisions forward. And, and of course, there's some sensitivity to that. We want to be very respectful of the family, so you don't allow uh, going, us going in there and doing the show in there or showing video from that, although people can visit it. The, the families have been unbelievably gracious in allowing us to share Columbia with our workforce for teaching purposes. We thank them very much for that. We take really good care of Columbia and protect her very well, as if she was still solid flight hardware flying. Um, so we want to protect the dignity and the respect and reverence of the room. And within those constraints, we take folks in the proper way and, and make it a teaching, a learning environment, if you will. Now, as you started this program, how important was it to you to get uh, senior leadership behind this? That's one thing. When you start a brand new program up, uh, buy-in and collaboration is key. So my first step was to approach our senior leadership. Um, I am so humbled and thankful that our senior leadership um, stepped right up and gave full support and backing to the creation of this program. And that support has not only uh, continued, but it's strengthened over the last couple of years. So in uh, great appreciation to our leadership for helping us. Speaking of leadership, we had a chance to sit down with Bob Cabana to get his perspective on the Apollo Challenger Columbia Lessons Learned program. Let's check it out. Bob, I know you're very familiar with the Lessons Learned program, but tell me a little bit about your history with the program. So it's one of the things I'm very proud of here at uh, Kennedy Space Center. Mike Janelli has just done an outstanding job. And what we don't want to do is forget the lessons learned from the past. You know, after the Challenger accident, they just kind of took what remained a Challenger and buried it in a silo. And it was like, we want to forget about this and move on. Columbia was different. We have Columbia in a room preserved over in the vehicle assembly building. And it's actually used by universities. Folks can get parts loaned out to them for research to help make spacecraft better to learn about the impacts of, you know, 
returning in that kind of environment, what we can do to make it better. But the, the more important part is not just the way we have treated the hardware, but it's also how we treat our people and the lessons that we want to remember from this. You know, if you look at Apollo, Challenger, Columbia, all the time when you go back, the hardware was talking to us and Challenger was the normalization and deviancy. That we had O-rings that were bad, we saw soot, but we came to accept it because nothing bad happened. And, and then you look at Columbia, the foam's coming off, but nothing bad has happened and we accepted it. We don't want to forget that. And part of, uh, you know, Apollo, Challenger, Columbia lessons learned is helping to keep it in the forefront, to help folks see what we learned so that we don't repeat those mistakes again, and help to create an environment where, where people are listened to. Yeah, I imagine that's very important, that idea of, you know, not letting things become rote and letting them just continue as they were, but constantly being vigilant about looking at all our processes and things like that moving forward. No, I mean, nothing that we do is without risk if it's worthwhile. And, and flying in space is an extremely risky business. But, you know, we've been given this goal now. Boots on the moon by 2024, right? And I'm, I'm all in. I want to I see that happen. But we have to do it in an environment that allows people to speak up. Now, that doesn't mean we do what you want to do but it, we have to address people's concerns. I, I greet all our new employees every two weeks when they come on board. And I talk about our core values and I talk about lessons learned from uh, Challenger in Columbia and the need to create an environment in your meetings where you feel free to speak up. And you know, we hire a lot of really smart people, okay? But when you're new and you're going to a meeting, sometimes you may know something, but you think, well, all these other people, they're a lot smarter than me. They've been here a lot longer. They know more than I know. I'm just gonna be quiet and listen. And what we have to do is ensure that we get everybody's input so that the decision makers are making informed decisions. And so it's incumbent upon us who are leaders. You have to stimulate discussion. If nobody's speaking up, then you have to ask questions to stimulate that discussion and get people talking so that all the concerns are addressed so that we make our decisions in an informed manner. You know, I had an all hands the other day, and, and I said, let me see a show of hands out in the audience. How many of you were not here when we lost uh, Columbia? And it was close to half the audience raised their hand, all right? So that's a lot of folks that weren't part of that loss, that grieving, that learning experience that we had. So we have to find a way to make those lessons known to them. If I had my way, every new senior executive at NASA would have to walk through the Columbia room and see the results of the decisions we make. And none of the people that made any of those decisions on Apollo, Challenger, or Columbia thought they were putting the crew in harm's way. They thought they were making good decisions. You know, Mike, Bob talked about when Challenger happened, NASA decided to sort of close the door and put everything away and not even address it. But with Columbia, you came out and said, look, we got to change our, our ways. I get that question a lot of folks ask of, you know, why was Challenger handled this way? Perhaps in Columbia was different. And I think the only way to really answer that question effectively is say it's, it's a different time. The folks that handled the Challenger aftermath were doing the very best they could and doing what they thought was best to continue the program and to do what was right. And the folks in Columbia did the same. So I, I never look back and say, which one is better, which one's worse. I say that they're different in many ways. And from having the honor for so many years of helping share Columbia with thousands of folks around the country, um, I can tell you that the power of Columbia to effectively change the hearts and minds of people and the power that the crew has through their stories, through their sacrifice, has been overwhelming. So I can tell you the impact she's had and will continue to have even larger going forward. You know what's fascinating? Uh, one of my tour guests brought this up at one time. He said, do you realize this is the only place in the world that this exists? The only place in the world that you have a spacecraft on limited display that you can teach the lessons learned. That was a very powerful observation and insight. Even in aviation, there's not many examples where you can go and actually tour 
a fallen aircraft to explore. So, so Colombia is something extremely unique for the agency, for our country, and even for the world because we share Colombia with our partners, international partners. So we realize how special Colombia really is and how much potential that uniqueness can serve us in the future in a very good way. And one last point that Bob brought up was talking about Artemis, you know, the, the mission of getting back to the moon by 2024. And taking all these lessons learned and applying it, like as you said before, to the next generation of engineers and scientists and, and how they're going to learn about those lessons learned and apply it to SLS and to Orion and to, and to the Artemis program. You know, what's amazing is when you look at history and you look at the present, there's so many similarities. History repeats itself. So we can look back and see how Apollo progressed, especially looking at the Apollo 1 accident and then Apollo 13 during the flight history of, of the Saturn program. And we can learn those lessons because we're flying a capsule again. Orion, in many ways, is similar to Apollo 1. Some technology, of course, will change. It'll advance. Um, some of our thinking, we grow and learn and do things better, hopefully. But human nature and human instincts, that's pretty consistent when you look over time. So when you look back to Titanic, when you look back way before that, accidents and the cause of accidents and, and human behavior, human instincts. Um, as a matter of fact, I call it the DNA thing. If we could just fix the DNA thing, we'd be in good shape. But that's what makes us individuals and unique. So we have the understanding that we have those challenges. We're always going to have those challenges and we can have those potential shortcomings. We have to be proactive and be ready for that and do better. Well, you know, Mike, another one of your great supporters is Chief Engineer Ralph Rowe from NASA headquarters. And I had a chance to sit down with Ralph and, and learn from his perspective, not only from the Columbia Accident Investigation, but also from the Lessons Learned program. Let's check it out. So, Ralph, uh, this may be a hard question to answer, but are there one or two key lessons learned from Columbia that you can share from your point of view? Yeah, I think there are some key safety tenants that we inherited from Apollo that we have to always remember. The way Apollo was successful is they follow these safety tenets. And we've seen when we don't follow those tenets, we have issues. Strong inline checks and balances. And engineers checking engineers. Nobody checks their own homework, right? Healthy tension between the responsible organizations and in the program so that there are separate but equal chains of command any one of which that can raise an issue and create that healthy tension that we need between the organizations to make the right decisions. And the third tenet is value-added independent assessment where any program is willing to bring in folks with a fresh set of eyes to look at their critical problems so that they don't uh, make mistakes. And on top of those three safety tenets, leadership has to really create the right environment for those safety tenants to work. So to me, those are the key aspects that I talk about when I talk with our folks and uh, anyone working in our industry, really. And it seems like this is even more important than ever because now with, you know, the, with the Artemis program going back to the moon, you know, with the commercialization of space, working with a lot of partners, a lot of outside companies, it's really not just NASA within, but it's gonna be NASA and its partners working this together. So how important is it gonna be down the road. Absolutely. It seems like we're almost in a boom era for space with new companies participating with us more than ever before. And so sharing our lessons, not only with our employees, but our partners is critical, right? They need to know what we've learned from Challenger in Columbia and Apollo 1, as well as our own folks. So I spent a lot of time going around to those companies and talking about the lessons from Columbia. I know Mike and the Columbia Room is going to do a road show and there'll be an opportunity for those folks to see the impact of the hardware from Columbia. So. And speaking about the road show, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not just a road show internal to, to NASA itself, but it's also to other outside organizations outside the aerospace industry that are interested in our lessons learned. That's right. The lessons just don't apply to aerospace. It's uh, any industry really. The, the fundamental things that we made mistakes with apply in any industry, really. So those root causes, those organizational issues that we had, those are things any company could learn from. 
Mike, thinking the tremendous benefit of this program, can you give us an example of the lessons that you've learned that you've been able to share with NASA and maybe some of its partners? Certainly. Uh, that's one thing with the lessons we've come through with. Um, they've been very applicable across industries and programs, which is very interesting. Uh, for example, communication. It's one of the things we do every single day. We communicate. It seems like all we do today are texting, we're typing, we're talking, communicating in a whole different array of ways. But are we communicating effectively? When we look back at Challenger, for example, we can see so many examples throughout pre-launch of where people did not communicate effectively or communicated in ways that perhaps weren't very effective to getting the right results. We look at Columbia and how we handled that situation. There's also many examples of where we could have done much better. So communication is something that even though we do it a lot, doesn't mean we do it great all the time. So we look at that, we can take those lessons and apply those into other industries. It could be any industry, it could be our home lives. Those lessons are so applicable across all kinds of genres. Another one, for example, is normalization of deviance. And that's a fancy NAS way of saying something that creeps into our system that slowly changes over time that shouldn't, but it's kind of a hitchhiker onto change. For example, uh, during Challenger's time, before Challenger, we start seeing small degradation of the O-rings. We start getting used to seeing that damage. We didn't forget about it, we didn't ignore it, we were working the problem, but it became normalized, almost expected in some ways. Fast forward to Columbia, we start seeing foam coming off the external tank since the first flight. We, we dealt with the issue for decades, trying to find a solution to it. We got very used to the foam coming off. And as a matter of fact, I'll speak for myself, when the vehicles would come back home after landing, you'd see some damage on the belly. And if the vehicles had less damage, that seemed a little abnormal. You were expecting to see more damage. So that became normalized over time. Those are that human DNA I mentioned earlier. It's so easy to sneak into our system. How often have any of us driven with our car and you had that little light on the dashboard on? Right. And then that one day... You're shaming us. <laughs> <laughs> I heard stories about you. <laughs> and that one day the light goes out, right? And it's like, wow, why'd that light go out? That's really weird. Well, I could probably guess when you bought the car, it didn't come off the lot with that light on. Right, but we got so normalized to that, or the knock in the engine, or the thump in the tire. We just, as people, get normalized and used to things that are different. So, although stuff does change, we gotta be extra vigilant to watch out for the things that shouldn't change, and then respond quickly to those, communicate effectively to those, and solve it before it becomes a larger issue. Well, is, is it fair to say, in, in, in that regard, let's we take the car for the example as an example, where, you know, when we drive a car, we hear the knock, we always say, well, we'll deal with it next week. We'll deal with it the week after until something happens where we can't drive the car. Well, in, in the space industry, you can't do that, right? You can't do that. I mean, you're you're flying 17,500 miles an hour. You just can't pull over and take a look under the right. hood. We're dealing with microsecond decisions. We're making split-second decisions, systems that aren't very hospitable to things that shouldn't happen. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be watching for those. And it goes beyond rockets and space flight. These critically important lessons can help us do better in other fields, like public and private aviation, in the automotive industry with safer cars for our friends and our families. Other modes of transportation like trains, helicopters, and ships can benefit. They can even help us in construction, leading to safer equipment, which help us lead to safer roads and buildings and bridges. You know, we're also very honored to be sharing our lessons with the Department of Defense and all branches of our military as they try to ensure the safety of our heroes, whether they be on land, in the skies above us, or even under and on the sea. Excitingly, we're now even building strategic partnerships with folks we never before envisioned, like the Centers for Disease Control and even the nuclear power industry. Simply put, there are so many different and diverse areas we believe we can make a really great contribution to our future. Well, Mike, you're working with a lot of institutions and companies. But with lessons learned, it's not just about number of partners, it's also about diversity of voice. We went to NASA headquarters to find out how NASA is making sure we listen and learn from every voice within the agency. I'm here at NASA headquarters today talking with Steve Shi. Steve, tell us a little bit about what you do here at NASA. Sure, I'm the Associate Administrator for Diversity and Equal Opportunity here at NASA. And what that means is it's my job to help the different organizations and people at NASA work together effectively. You do a lot of work in your office, but tell us how you're working with the Lessons Learned Program. When we look at the Lessons Learned Program, we see a number of accidents 
And it's easy to remember the technical issues, the engineering problems, the technical defects that occurred that contributed to those accidents. But if you examine those accidents, you also see that there were people and culture inclusion issues as well. Specifically, certain individuals with maybe unconventional thinking, unpopular opinions, weren't fully included. They didn't have the, we didn't have the benefit of, of uh, including all the information, the data, the perspectives, the concerns that they shared. And if we had fully included all of that uh, thinking, that cognitive diversity, uh, then maybe we would have had a different outcome or at least been able to um, assure the mission and, and safety in a better way. How does that stretch out into NASA's partners and how they conduct business as it pertains to risk management and a diversity of opinions and, and uh, information? We provide leadership, we provide technical assistance, and we actually do audits of recipients of NASA grants. These are scientific and research organizations, including universities and colleges that do research for us. And as a condition of receiving those grants, they have to comply with anti-discrimination statutes. So that helps ensure that there's discrimination-free workplaces in those organizations. They're accessing and including the best minds, the best thinking, the best talent to be able to arrive to the best product to help NASA. The other thing here is that uh, NASA is uniquely positioned to actually lead the world because of our mission. We have a peaceful mission to explore, to discover, and to expand knowledge for all humankind. And so because of that role, not only is the work we do inspirational, but if you look at the technological advances that we bring to the world, the way individuals and organizations will follow our leadership because of the inspiration and because of what we're doing, and by how we conduct ourselves and provide that as a model, we have the ability to be able to really have far-reaching impacts. NASA has many big missions in this future. What does success look like through lessons learned for the agency? I think with any type of program, the success ultimately is dependent on how it contributes to safety and mission assurance. And so if we're able to launch these missions um, safely and successfully and on time, uh, and it's because of lessons learned to a certain extent, then I think that's an indication of success. But ultimately, we have this incredible platform to make an even bigger difference beyond NASA. So what I like to talk about is that uh, it's the job of my office to help NASA provide air. That's uh, psychological safety, uh, feeling that people won't be retaliated against so that they have oxygen to breathe. They don't have to hold their breath. They can really be at their best. And it's also our job to help NASA provide space and that means room for people to be included and to feel like they belong. Because if they feel that way, they're gonna be at their best and they're gonna fully contribute. And the great thing is that our, our mission is, as an agency, is about exploration, discovery, and expansion of knowledge for the benefit of all humankind. And so I like to say at NASA, we make air and space available for everyone. So Mike, another part about the lessons learned program that I love is the tour stops. It's kind of like the, uh, the rock concert tour. Yeah. You know, I need the t-shirt with the dates on it. Yeah. Tell us about the tour stops. And that's something really, really exciting coming along. As we talked earlier, the power of the Columbia Room, the power of sharing the artifacts and the stories of the crew and how we can change the future. Over time, I kept thinking, this is great. We're getting thousands of people through the room, but you know what? That's not enough. There's so many more people we can help impact in a positive way. So how do we do that? We can't take them all here to the Kennedy Space Center. We can't bring them all into the VAB or in the Columbia Room. But what if Columbia came to them? So the concept of the Col Space Shuttle Columbia National Tour became to take Columbia on the road, to bring it to those literally millions of people that can't come here and to share those stories, to share those lessons forward. So we started off in April. We did April 12th in retrospect of the 30th anniversary of STS-1, the first launch of Columbia. So now we relaunched Columbia on our first anniversary to bring Columbia on our next mission. So the mission continues, mission to inspire, to educate and change hearts and minds. So we, we're here at the Kennedy Space Center and we shared the artifacts in a new display for the workforce. We also had um, a center-wide event that we had senior leadership there and the workforce was able to come. As we travel from center to center around the country, Columbia comes, we come with a message, a center-wide event, 
reinforce training, and then we're also going to take breakout meetings and go into branch level and division level meetings and take this story to smaller groups of folks and have those more intimate conversations on how these lessons can be applicable and helpful to their organizations. And that also isn't limited to NASA centers. There's a possibility that you can go beyond that. That's the exciting part. As this continues, one thing that's just amazed me is the potential. It's unbelievable and it's exciting because NASA, our charter is to help everyone, right? We want to make the world a better place and more safe and successful for everyone. So within that charter to go do that, we see the potential. For example, when you look at a firing room and what happens in a firing room to launch a rocket, I would offer to say an operating room and a firing room are very, very similar and you can't make mistakes. Time is of the essence. Communication is critical. You can't have deviance in the system. You gotta be very effective what you do. So there's the medical industry. And I can give you dozens of other examples of how. So I'm more amazed every time you think about it or talk to other folks, you get more inspired of how many ways NASA through this program can actually impact in a positive way and partner and collaborate with organizations within the federal government and with outside the federal government, private organizations, international organizations, academia. Incredible. Well, Mike, I just want to congratulate you on a job well done. You still have a lot of work to do because it's just in its infancy, but you're, you're going in the right direction. Thank you. And I, I'm working with a lot of great people. And the great exciting part of this, it's not just me. I may be leading this effort, but there are thousands of people inside and outside the agency that are going to help make this successful, in addition to the crew that's watching over us as well. So all together, we're going to make this an amazing program and help a lot of people. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for being on the show. I feel like I have a lot of lessons I still need to learn, but I'll tell you what, it has been fabulous. Thank you so much for the opportunity. No, thank you. You're watching NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA.